Good day, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, session organized by Transpricing Associates, uh, which is uh, titled uh, BAPS, Are You in Control? Um, I'm pleased uh, to see that uh, 26 countries, uh, people from 26 countries have registered uh, for this event, which obviously means that uh, it uh, has stirred the emotions of a lot of you. Um, my name is Dave Hybrex. I'm uh, one of the speakers today, together with my, with my colleagues uh, Igor Peters, Igne Valuta, and uh, Luan Verdoner, and we will be uh, sharing with you the latest insight on uh, on BAPS and uh, what it means for your uh, company. Um, we would like to go to the um, uh, next slide. There's a few pra practical things. If you have any questions, uh, since you are in a mute mode at this moment please type them in your chat box, uh, which means we will pick them up and address them during, uh, during the, uh, the one-hour call. Um, if there's any other questions, burning questions, please uh, reach out to us after, after this call. Uh, the, the next slide shows the contact details of the presenters. If I would uh, start with the agenda on slide four, we want to reach out to you and, and tell you about the wider context in which BAPS is, uh, is, is being triggered. We want to address the core topics uh, as well as the timetable. Then um, we will share with you two business models, uh, which are one acceptable and one not acceptable under, um, under BAPS. Then uh, two main themes of today's uh, call will be uh, are you ready for BAPS? And, and even more important, if you're ready for it, are you in control on any BAPS implications uh, you, which might hit your, your organization? Uh, last but not least, we will address a few lessons learned until, until today. So, kick-starting the, uh, the discussion with uh, the wider context, I think the first question is, what is the name of the game? And this is slide six. Uh, the name of the game could be tax evasion and fraud to counteract base erosion. Um, it could also be that the name of the game is uh, tax authorities want more transparency, which means they want more of your information uh, to, uh, to use as a base for taxation. Uh, another base, which is slightly different, um, you could still be technically doing the right thing, but the audience, one of the stakeholders, could say this is an unethical way to use or abuse uh, tax laws and, and, and tax treaties. So you get into the category not illegal but unethical. Again, different stakeholders have, uh, have different interests. So the OECD uh, quite clearly with uh, the country by country uh, matrix uh, launched is trying to avoid wide income, income not taxed anywhere. NGOs are, are more interested in, uh, in driving uh, corporate social responsibility. The public domain doesn't really know what a fair and balanced tax system is, but will still use the words. Um, the UN, I think, in, uh, in, has, has uh, uh, gotten itself in a pretty good position to, to promote location savings and market premium. At the end of the day, U.S. corporate taxpayers uh, are looking for avoidance of double taxation. So you, if you operate in one country, you only want to pay tax once on that same profit. So this is what could be considered the name of the game. If we look from, if we look to the the responses from uh, the street, and uh, that's the next slide. Um, we see the OECD saying on the country-by-country country reporting that this uh, would require taxpayers to set uh, forth exhaustive details on how they allocate income taxes and business activities. That is sort of the big wish list for any tax inspector which which they express there. So there's, uh, there's, there's a clear motive uh, by, by tax authorities. 
Um, even in the wider context, uh, uh, people like Kofi Annan do seem to address transfer pricing and BAPS as an issue, um, which in, in, in the following quote addresses the perceived abuse of transfer pricing in places like Africa. Uh, more interesting, which is on the next slide, is the perception which is displayed by uh, Mr. Danielak, uh, the Deputy Commissioner, uh, commissioner at, at the IRS. He says uh, in, in the middle section of this slide, I'm worried that U.S. companies are paying too much tax in a lot of local tax bases just to avoid controversy on BAPs. So he sees it as a, as a measure which might work the other way, that U.S. companies are, are reporting less taxable base in, in, in their home country, in this case being the U.S. Um, there's at least a political debate going on within the U.S. where the U.S. should really support uh, an initiative like uh, BAPS. Uh, on the other side, and that's maybe more a European flavor, the, the train has left the station and, and this, this whole um, and tsunami of BEPS initiatives uh, seems uh, ir irreversible from uh, from my perspective. Also, in our direct uh, discussions with uh, the people in Paris, uh, the OECD, who are writing all of uh, all of these if, uh, initiatives on a piece of paper. If we move to the next slide, it, it really touches upon the question whether this is changing the rules of international taxation and transferring over uh, uh, in in. Uh, in a short period of time. If the OECD would be looking at the reporting of correct financial and tax data, where fair, effective, and efficient tax systems are sort of driving their, uh, that is the driving motive from an OECD perspective. You could also say it's, it's more um, about leveling the playing field between Corporate, uh, corporate society and, and the tax, uh, tax authorities by creating a high degree of transparency. And as country by country reporting, if you combine it with uh, the overall profitability of a group, you could be tempted as tax inspector to start applying some simple formula apportionments on that to check whether the income reported in your territory is indeed fair according to, uh, uh, to those standards. Um, here you also see some uh, some overlap with other initiatives like the VAT information exchange system, which was introduced in an EU setting, and Fiscalis, which is a work program where tax authorities are trying to create and exchange information which is relevant for taxation of uh, multinationals uh, in multiple jurisdictions. I think uh, that the next point, if we look at the OECD fundamentals, uh, the question is whether this BAPS concept um, on economic substance does change the rules of the game if we look at, uh, at Article 1. Um, or um, another example, if the introduction of concepts uh, under the Digital Economy Initiative of virtual PEs does change the fundamentals of taxation. Uh, and I think that's that's much more worrying uh, if through the back door the OECD tries to introduce concepts which do change a sort of concise model of consensus which has been built up over the last uh, 20 years. Um, last but not least, but less clear is the uh, corporate social responsibility elements to uh, to uh, uh, the, the uh, taxation. Uh, at this stage, it's very hard to uh, to have a clear definition and, and norm on that. Um, so this is sort of setting the wider scope. Now I want to hand over to Igor Peters, who will illustrate us, uh, will give us an illustration of the core topics and the timelines involved in BAPS. Igor? Thank you, Steve. Yeah, and the core topics, uh, as mentioned, BAPS is focusing on transparency and has a strong focus on economic substance. Uh, where is it uh, enhancing the transparency? Well, that boils down to the country-by-country country reporting. That's considered to be one of the, well, the core elements by most of the stakeholders into the BEPS. The use of economic substance to drive taxation 
here you should think of applying concepts that are currently used in applying uh, Article 7 to Article 9 of the OECD Model and Tax Treaty. So headcount might be driving again, or at least it is perceived as possibly driving again the modus for taxation, uh, kind of sneaking in formula apportionment approach. The elimination of tax leakages through enhanced cooperation between governments. Also here, a strong focus, as mentioned earlier, on the exchange of information. In the EU, the Fiscalis program uh, receives a huge budget to also include uh, direct taxation into a new database. This database should be accessible by all national tax authorities on the EU-wide basis. The promotion of the broadening of the taxable base. I think of the concepts launched in the action plan for digital economy, like a virtual PE or a sales nexus PE. And then last but not least, the implementation of all these BEP actions <coughs> at the same time. The OECD already announced there will be an additional mechanism implemented in order to synchronize the rollout of all the actions to all countries at the same time. If we go to the next slide, uh, you see the timelines of the various, the 15 uh, BEPS action plans. Some of them have immediate impact, some of them intermediate and long term. For instance, long term, because the outcome of the BEPS action would be a definition of the issues at hand, a definition of possible actions to be launched. So there's not immediate effect of it. Um, action number two, neutralize hybrid mismatch arrangements. Well, currently, a lot of discussion is going on. Should that be via top-down approach or bottom-up? approach and the draft is published ready in March. Uh, counter number five, counter harmful tax practices more effectively taking into account transparency and substance. Well that that split over immediate and intermediate because initial step would be to align all the OECD members and in a second phase try to get along all the non-EU OECD members, read the UN members. Immediate uh, effects, well, that would be the draft made for the intangibles, uh, chapter six, because it contains a lot of concepts that could be applied already by tax authorities when they're zooming into intangibles. Action plan number 13, re-examine transfer pricing documentation. Uh, immediate, as the plan is to include that uh, on a very short notice already to the transfer pricing guidelines. Uh, number 15, the development of uh, multilateral instruments. That's the alignment where it would be uh, adopted into well, tax treaty, model tax treaties, for instance, or adopted into the commentaries. Um, yeah, I would like to hand over to my colleague uh, Luan. Thank yeah, you. Just, uh, just one uh, point, sorry, uh, Luan, to interrupt. Uh, I think the multilateral instrument is supposed to be drafted and signed or negotiated between September and December 2015. That means the tax authorities really think that all these words on a piece of paper are going to create some impact on your corporate tax position at the latest 1-1-2016. So that is a very short timeline where we should recognize that the OECD is only an advisor to uh, the member sh the states who are invited to sign this multilateral uh, agreement. Um, so it's, it's not like this is part of the mandate. Then the next question is how quickly will that process of rollout, uh, Igor referred to, uh, hit your 
um, your attention or the attention of the tax authorities were on some of these initiatives like the country-by-country uh, country reporting and the intangibles, we already know it's, it's hitting you today. Uh, so that's just an, uh, an, an alert almost like this is, yes, the train has left the station, and yes, there's going to be an output which is going to be used by tax inspectors quite quickly and even convert it into something formal which they can relate to and rely on. Where Sorry, the rollout would be really into domestic law, so that takes much longer. That's questionable. Go on. Yeah. Or sure. Okay. Thank you, Igor and Steve. Um, we are now approaching the question: What is an acceptable transfer pricing setup under BEPS? And we divided that question over two slides for A and for B. So let's start with for A. Um, and that's a defendable, uh, in our op uh, op opinion, that is a, a, a centralized uh, setup which might be defendable under normal circumstances. And that uh, setup is uh, construed in the following way. Um, in the center, there is a, a, a hub, a centralized uh, company, which acts as profit center as, long, as well as investment center. And you might know from uh, the, the famous uh, Discussion draft on intangibles that uh, if you are an investment center, you are absorbing the famous D, E, M, and P functions, that is development, enhancement, maintenance, and protection of IP as basis, uh, coupled with cost absorption and cloud of contractual lines. So that's a centralized hub. And apart from that, you have cost center contractors at the one side and revenue center sales service at, at, the, at the other side. So the cost centers. They do manufacturing, R&D, logistics, packaging, and shared service. The revenue ones do sales, marketing, repair, warranty, and call centers. The assumption is the operating margin in total would be 10%. So the question is how to divisionalize it over all the member companies of the group. And as you can see, cost plus 50% is allocated uh, to the cost centers and an operating margin in excess of 2 to 4% will be allocated to the revenue center. So the question is, what is left at the real center? Well, we can say that 50%, um, we can make the assumptions, all assumptions, because it's a stylized model, that 50% as allocated to the cost centers will be will correspond to 1% of the 10% of the operating margin. And let's assume that while operating margin is in excess of T to 4%, it could be 4% exactly. And that's, that makes, uh, makes up at uh, 5% in total and is leaving 5% of the 10% operating margin to the investment center. So that sounds reasonable. And if you see the, the, the white and gray blocks at the bottom, uh, which uh, um, provide access to residual uh, results and some access to residual results, then access to residual results to the profit center plus investment center being uh, compounded into one company can be reasonable and defendable. So that's 4.A. And now we uh, switch over to slide 4.B. And that's also the question of an acceptable transfer pricing, and that is what we call the red zone. The former one is called the green zone, and this one is called the red zone. And you can imagine what the red zone is, is configuring. Uh, in the red zone, the, the, the assumption is that more than 50% of overall operating margin is called white income. And white income, you know, well, you can see it as an axiom, white income is the tainted one in BEPS. So it's, it's the income which is under discussion. Um, the centralized company is split into two hubs. The IP company, which is the real investment center, so the IP creation and management, um, and the part of CSA, uh, cost sharing agreement with the USA. And the profit center is the dashboard of matchmaker. And so it, uh, this is two separate companies, but which is very important, that is they don't have any or hardly ever any f f functions, risk and assets on the, or significant people functions. That that means that suppose there are um, max 10% uh, FTAs for uh, 
FDA is decision makers, then uh, and, and they are getting 90% of overall uh, profit margin, that creates a discrepancy which is hardly defendable. And if we see to the cost center contractors in that model, then cost plus 5%, when if cost plus 50% is corresponding to 50%, 15%, or to, sorry, to 1% of the whole operating margin, then cost plus 5% will be amount, on and around 1% of that, uh, less than 1%, uh, one third of 1% of that. And on the other side, um, if revenue center operating margin is in excess of 2%, so it's it's exceeding uh, the, the, the ceiling, which is set to, to a reasonable uh, um, revenue, then you can see that, uh, well, there is more than, at least more than 80 or 90 percent is lending into the both the uh, uh, centralized hub and then the tension between the, the, the FTAs and the real residual profit can create a lot of issues which you have to defend uh, against the various tax jurisdiction. So that's, in a, in a, in a more, more simplified way, the, the contradiction between an acceptable and an unacceptable centralized tax model. And now I'd like to hand over the phone to uh, Igne, who will, hand, uh, will talk about BEPS. Are you ready? Igne. Okay, thank you, Luan. Uh, so uh, I will continue on BEPS assessment tool developed by TPA. So uh, TPA has recently developed a BEPS uh, proof assessment tool. Basically, BEPS readiness test uh, allows companies to identify at a high level their readiness to comply with BEPS. As such, uh, BEPS readiness uh, assessment is ready to assist companies in prioritizing their improvement initiatives and developing actionable tax trend surprising risk management tactics. The process of BEPS readiness assessment is visualized in the next slide. So BEPS proof assessment is structured into three major stages. First of all, uh, we request uh, upfront information from the client, which we believe uh, is showcasing its readiness to comply with BEPS. Uh, second, we run a series of interviews with finance, tax, transfer pricing, and commercial stakeholders. And finally, within 24 hours after we leave, we leave the premises of our client, we deliver a BEPS assessment report, which is based on a dashboard type of presentation. And it is important to mention that a BEPS readiness report allows the CFO or global head of tax or transfer pricing to assess and communicate BEPS risks in a really realistic and a fairly simple manner to all stakeholders. Um, now I will give a bit more details how the process works in practice. So for this purpose, let's move to the next slide. Yes, so in this slide, uh, uh, you see the list of information we are asking uh, to share with us up front. We are also asking if and in so far possible for headquarters to fill in country by country reporting. So more about the interviews, that interviews itself, uh, uh, let's move to the next slide. Yes. Uh, the typical interviews are structured in the following manner. So we interview a certain number of stakeholders and in total, we have one full day of interviews. Uh, based on these interviews, for each of these audiences uh, being interviewed separately, we come up with an assessment on the risk of each of the best action points. Uh, just to give you a feeling of what kind of questions we are running through during our interview sessions, we give you an illustration on best action point uh, one, digital economy, in the next slide. So by addressing the first uh, action point, digital economy, you can expect questions like, do you run your business uh, through a digital presence, like servers, that triggers consequences for low, medium, or high risk profile? So let's say if you have an answer to this question, yes, we do, you have a high risk. And the whole approach here is that a management board uh, takes an explicit position on that while TPA takes political and technical assessment on the same position or the same questions. 
and uh, it is obvious that if you come up with a different assessment than a management board, you need to start talking about that and you need to communicate that. Um, if we add all these results or all the answers to these questions, it leads uh, us to a mapping of uh, management board perceived risks and TPA perceived risks, which is displayed in the next slide. So let's take a high tech companies example. So in this case, we see that assessment, uh, BEPS assessment, leads high tech company to the following mapping. Uh, BEPS action point, so digital economy, is clearly a high risk. And uh, the same as, for example, uh, action point 13, which uh, addresses uh, trans pricing documentation. And uh, it is also important to mention that the assessment uh, also leads to some insights that are highlighted uh, as a result in the BEPS report. Can we move to the next slide? Yes. So finally, uh, BEPS assessment report requires an action pl plan by a company on how to run tax planning and risk mitigation. And I think it's uh, all from my side. Dave, do you have anything to add at this point? Yeah, I would, uh, thanks, Signe. I would like to add that uh, the, the biggest fear uh, uh, most corporates have is that uh, tax and, and transfer pricing risks uh, uh, reach a tipping point where it becomes, um, it becomes a reputational risk. So the reasons why uh, CFOs and management boards in corporates are worried about this is because they read on other corporates um, cases on the front page uh, of the newspaper that those companies are not BAPS compliant. And that means there's a, there's a driver, uh, there's a pressure from society, there's a pressure from tax authorities, there's a pressure from uh, the, the World Bank, United Nations. Uh, to change uh, some of the reporting and communication uh, around tax and, and transfer pricing. And I think that's, that's one of the, the major points you're, uh, you're reading. Uh, one of the previous presentations we've, we've been given, um, the, the corporates asked the TPA whether we were even willing and able to, to run uh, media training courses uh, because of the communication with the outside world has become somewhat tricky for two reasons. Uh, if you don't know what the rules of the game and the name of the game is, then it's very hard to, to be compliant with the, the, the rules of the game. Uh, and secondly, uh, since, since uh, OECD and as well as corporates um, do live in a very complex world called taxation, uh, and taxation is not easily explained to to uh, any of the other stakeholders. It is a very a hard bargain to, uh, in a very simple way, if you're the CFO of a company and you're on the 8 o'clock news being interviewed to state you're BAPS ready, it's very hard to give five pointers with, without being challenged uh, that, yes, indeed, we are uh, BAPS, uh, BAPS ready uh, and BAPS proof. So I think that's uh, that's a, a, a real challenge. Uh, any any comments, Igor Luan, on on, on that? No, not. Uh... Um, the the comparison I'm making with BAPS and and, and as a BAPS tsunami is, every one of you is sitting on the beach in a quiet chair, enjoying the. The beautiful sea and the sunny, uh, sunny weather, uh, but the earthquake uh, uh, has happened uh, quite a, a far distance away from you. And then the question uh, to you is: Are you going to just sit still and enjoy the calm sea and the sunny weather, or are you going to be worried somewhat and at least think about what if something happens? What is my contingency planning? So this BAPS readiness test is not giving you um, a, a full proof that so my house is in order uh, at the end of the day, I have 100% score and I don't need to do anything anymore. It's really getting you um, alerted to build a contingency plan to be BAPS ready and to be uh, 
to have a game uh, a game plan A, B, C, and D. Uh, what to do if this wave sets you in this direction with this height and and this speed? Are you climbing a tree? Are you running away? Are you just going to sit still in that chair? That's sort of the uh, the visual I want to uh, I want to share with you. <coughs> if you find out you are BAPS ready or halfway BAPS ready, uh, and we we talked to one corporate which says um, we're we did our BAPS readiness test because we talked to the audit committee. We agreed with the audit committee. We have a, um, a few workflows. We look at limitation on benefits and treaties. We look at country-by-country um, country reporting how that would hit us. We're looking at how do we get data points to populate even the country-by-country country reporting. Um, and we are going to look uh, whether we have um, any digital economy in our value chain which we need to worry about in the, in the light of the, of the publications. And even beyond that, we're going to report that back to the audit committee. Actually, we have to report it back to the audit committee before December 2014. And that's, that's sort of the, uh, the way some of the corpus have been applying it. What I, what I see in practice, though, is that not everyone has been uh, so uh, proactive in, in this self-reflection. Uh, that, that's another way of saying that every one of you already look in the mirror and, and draw a conclusion we're perhaps ready. Um, till today, we believe uh, less than 5-10% of, uh, of corporates have been doing this uh, looking in the mirror type of exercise. Uh, so that's that's where we believe this BAPS readiness test uh, uh, either initiated by yourself, like this corporate we talked to uh, yesterday, or um, uh, assisted by uh, BAPS readiness test uh, TPA has developed uh, would, be, would be highly recommendable. Um, if we move to the, the next slide, which is, I think, even more important, you want to be a good corporate citizen. Basically, it means you want to stay away from the from the front page of the newspaper with your name on it with something negative uh, besides it as an accusation, especially in relationship to tax. Then you need to look at this picture and say, okay, if I want to be a good corporate citizen, I need a well-defined governance model. I need a um, translation of that governance model because a governance model is a very fancy word to say I, I have a pledge to society that I will behave as a good corporate citizen. Uh, you need to translate it to people. So you need to translate it and, and uh, that's, that's called a control framework. You need to appoint certain people, uh, have certain accountability, certain responsibility and, and you can apply concepts like the RACI concept to, to allocate those roles and responsibilities to live up to that pledge you just gave to society. Once you appointed those people, those people will issue policies on finance, on tax, on transfer pricing, and they will subsequently themselves or, or upon delegation ask other people to do a proper and a timely implementation of those policies. That's sort of the whole cycle where in, in this visualization we, we added two, uh, two blue lines. One is you need a very full and transparent communication to the market, uh, to the stakeholders, but also internally. So it needs to be clear to, to, to uh, any one of you who in your organization signs off on the transfer pricing report for India, who in your organization signs off or will sign off on a country-by-country um, country reporting in 50 countries? Is that someone with a data background? Is that going to be the global head of tax? Um, who is who's going to be accountable? Um, that is a new initiative uh, by the uh, ATO, the uh, Australian uh, Tax Authorities, which says um, you can, on a voluntary base, report any 
income you report you you've uh, placed in offshore locations before December 2014, and we call this a voluntary reporting schedule. Uh, it is not entirely clear because this was a presentation in March by the, the highest ranked uh, officer in the, in the Australian tax authorities. What the consequences are if you don't report your offshore income in a voluntary way after December 2014. So we, we do believe uh, this, uh, this tsunami of BAPS will only hit you um, in the, in the uh, the, the year 2016, I think you need to be realistic and see that all types of authorities are suddenly waking up and uh, try to uh, try to outclass or how do you say it uh, to, to <coughs> supersede uh, the OECD initiatives and say uh, what OECD can do, I can do as well. Uh, so I'm coming up with all sorts of suggestions and uh, and initiatives which will force companies to showcase to me a, a high degree of transparency, especially when uh, in relationship to, to the economic uh, substance. I think that's sort of on the communication. On the, on the reporting back, uh, what we see a lot of companies uh, struggle with is, and that's sort of the, 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 the picture on the implementation of these policies um, implementation means you have an economic reality which, as you all know, is, is, is typically reflected in transfer price and documentation and benchmarks. Then you have a legal reality where you have intercompany legal agreements to take care of, uh, of your transfer pricing relationship between group uh, companies. However, the, 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 the thing missing in action is, is typically what is your financial data points say. So do you have access to your uh, SAP, your Oracle? Uh, how do you get the data points which are relevant for tax and transfer pricing? Can you access those on a transactional level, real time? Um, and, and this is sort of also an implementation um, element which, which directly hits your country by country reporting. So if you have not defined uh, if you don't have a defined country by country reporting uh, yourself as a as a corporate, can you really say you're in control if you're not even able to fill the data points in this country by country reporting the uh, tax authorities are going to throw at you uh, what is then the the definition of being in control, and how would you communicate that back uh, to the stakeholders being maybe the c f o well, maybe it's also uh, the reporting back to the uh, SAC, SEC when you report uncertain tax positions back into the, 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 the marketplace in, in case of stock quoted companies. So we, we see this, this, uh, this one pager as not something in, in a couple of years ago, this was a nice to have and it was a fancy word, corp corporate governance. Uh, the, the thing BAPS has done, it, it puts uh, transparency, and transparency is a benefit for tax authorities because it's uh, leveling the playing field, and it's putting a focus on economic substance, which means people and where people are is, is suddenly becoming very important for taxation. And uh, once that pressure is on, this one pager is not optional anymore but I would, uh, with some degree of, uh, of, of uh, looking after your health, I would, as a corporate, really be serious about setting up uh, a, a, an organizational standard of best practices and an operational standard of best practices with a clear, well-defined communication uh, as well as a well-defined reporting back. So, this, this is changing the world of how a, an in-house tax team runs uh, its uh, risk around taxation and, and transfer pricing. Um, it's changing it in, in many directions, and I, I think that is worthwhile uh, putting, a, putting a, a BATS readiness test on uh, at this very moment and not wait until the end of uh, 
2015 or even beyond that. Okay, um, I think that's that's it on the are you in control? Uh, we are seeing a lot of corporates uh, who are very busy with uh, with organizing this, although in some corporates the organizational standard is, has more the attention of the CFO and the operational standard has more the attention of um, the in-house tax and, and transpricing department, not necessarily with the proper communication between those two or the reporting line back. And sometimes the complaint is simply, we uh, run a tax compliance department and the commercial people don't want to talk to us. So we don't get the information. Uh, we can't get from the finance department the data points. So how are we going to be in control on our tax and transpricing? Question mark. Uh, so we, we come across quite a few uh, disconnects uh, in the organizational best practices, which leads to huge problems in the operational standards. Okay, um, I think that moves us to the uh, uh, the next uh, slide. Uh, before doing that, I would like to ask anyone in the audience if they have any questions to share those uh, through uh, through uh, the chat facility on uh, on your computer. Maybe I build in a few seconds for you to to type out your questions if there's. Any questions? We uh, we get one question uh, on uh, whether the UN is also busy with some some BAPS related action points. Uh, the the only thing I can share with you is that um, the UN through the World Bank is uh, is taking stock um, of um, a few uh, a few topics. One of them is. Uh, how does transfer pricing uh, in the mining industry in Africa change if you would follow the OECD standards of transfer pricing versus the UN standards of transfer pricing? I would say that's a more generic concept. Uh, what is the transfer pricing creating as a leakage in the taxable base in Africa? So yeah, it's about transparency and it's about economic substance in in that sense. Uh, you, the, the, the World Bank or the UN, through the World Bank, is is taking similar steps, but not uh, not different from what they did in the past. At least I I have not heard the uh, the UN is uh, is taking initiatives uh, which are perhaps related at this stage. Yeah, I think they mentioned that they will. Uh, it was last year, the year before, where they published their UN uh, transfer pricing manual, and also there is a chapter on intangibles, and they mentioned that they would wait on the outcome of the OECD, and then, well, if, if required, would change that chapter also, but they're not in the initiative. Yeah. Okay. Um, if we turn to, I think we turn to the next slide, and what we just visualized in, the, in, in slide 21 is here being uh, shared again in the word format. So having a corporate governance model in place is, is going to be essential uh, to convert that to real people uh, and, and connect it with org charts where, where a tax control framework work and uh, Transfer pricing control framework is is being defined um, is going to be essential if you if you uh, define it on a piece of paper uh, without the people obviously it's uh, it's pretty much a hollow phrase and you can't live up to the pledge to society. I think the next one is is important to have a written documentation um, on policies on finance transfer pricing, but also very important, intellectual property policy. So who is owning what portion of the intellectual property? And there's there's two ways of looking at it. Is it just the legal ownership or is it also who is uh, the economic owner? Can you put that in a policy? That might be difficult, but uh, if you're not making explicit statements, the tax authorities will uh, will uh, do, will provide you with their own interpretation who within the group is a co-owner uh, of uh, of the intangibles. 
um, a fourth point we already addressed, uh, if you have this economic reality, which is your master file, your transposition documents, and your benchmark, your legal reality, reflecting as your intercompany agreements and your financial accounting reality, which is your data points, ideally they're synchronized uh, as, as a magic triangle. Um, otherwise, you, you might run into too many Bermuda triangles where legally you put place the IP and certain profitability, and this is Luan's case with the, the red zone, um, you place a lot of IP rights in a sunny location with not or maybe even no FTEs at all uh, running it. Financially, you plant 90% of your profits there, but the economic substance, which is an overriding concept under BAPS, Will, will determine that since there's no one there, you cannot plant any profits on that sunny, tax-friendly island anymore. A point uh, of, of, yes, I think corporate should strive for transparency, but don't be ignorant on this. I think you will continue to have a conflict of interest with uh, tax authorities, so you, if, if you communicate how your value chain looks like, even if you go and are invited to a public uh, um, a seminar uh, and you're a speaker, be aware that you need to control your channel and the intensity of, of your communication. It's not uh, very wise these days to, to do a lot of uh, appearances and tell a lot about a lot of details about your value chain because interpretation of all the facts you're sharing with the public domain uh, might be picked up uh, uh, very easily. I know that there's been a very um, extensive report prepared by a, um, a professional in, in Germany uh, about IKEA and he's analyzed based on public domain information all uh, the, the, the details on, on, on the, the value chain as far as that information was publicly available. And it was surprisingly uh, detailed. Uh, so, and, and whether it was accurate or not, no one knows. But it will be used as a reference by, by tax authorities. Um, sticking to your business model, I think uh, business drives tax and not, not the other way around. Uh, one um, one observation I got from one of the corpus was not so much that BAPS is about transparency and economic substance, but BAPS is about um, another way of doing your value chain analysis, uh, just making your value chain one value chain analysis one layer deeper, which means you not only have to say that person is sitting in Singapore and his job profile is he's head of procurement, but you need to be able to define what what type of procurement processes this person is involved in and what type of decision this, decisions this person actually takes. Um, we, we all know we live in a virtual world, so it, it becomes a little bit tricky if the head of procurement is say in the UK and he has a deputy in Singapore and he has three deputies on the ground with the plants in China and they all make certain decisions then it becomes very tricky if the tax authorities say the, the, the people function has become very important and we consider the guy in the UK being the lead decision maker so we attribute all the benefits from the procurement function to, to that guy rather than to Singapore where you probably have landed uh, the, the main operational responsibility for, for procurement uh, while the UK is doing the policy angle to it. Um, so business model, yes, but uh, your economic analysis, sorry, your functional analysis on your value chain needs to probably go one layer deeper to convince tax authorities that the people in their countries, uh, in their local country, might not be the major decision maker. On, on the primary processes. Um, again, the, the media training uh, comes back. I think a lot of core corporates, and I'm sure the audience today is not an exception, will, will use corporate communication. 
in case any questions from the public domain or outside the corporate comes uh, on, on tax and transpricing. And uh, it's, it's quite common these days to have a very um, intensive uh, working relationship with your corporate, uh, corporate communication department to, uh, to address these issues. I think at the end, uh, the, the, the recommendation is reassess your economic substance and do preferably today and, 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 and don't wait with it until next month or next week even. Uh, do your BAPS readiness test. Uh, we see a lot of corporates already done it. Again, the 5 to 10% of the corporates I've met who have actually done the same level of detail, uh, detail as the TPA BAPS readiness test um, is, is sort of was a little bit disappointing from a perspective that, that uh, disappointing is not the right word. I think there's different risk perceptions on BAPS. There's a, a, a lower degree of um, awareness maybe or sense of urgency in the, in the U.S. compared to, for example, Europe. And, and maybe that can be explained because Starbucks was being questioned in the UK and that got full publicity around Europe and maybe uh, the, the publicity around uh, the CEO of Apple and in front of the US Congress got, got more promotional, uh, got more positive vibes than, than negative vibes. Uh, Starbucks certainly didn't in the, in, in the UK. Uh, so that might explain the different uh, the difference in in risk assessment and also the difference in um, urgency for corporates to already do it uh, do it today. I think if in a reactive mode, um, you need to ask uh, yourself: um, Is cost plus still the right number, or should in the, in the light in the light of uh, the discussions? Should you be looking at a cost plus 15 for routine functions if the whole value chain makes a 10% uh, or more operating margin? And I, I know a lot of companies, uh, especially those also in the, with activities in the BRIC countries, but I think this time it goes beyond the BRIC countries, are looking at uh, revamping their transfer pricing system and, and considering a slightly higher uplift on, on cost. Uh, the second point is, is, is your commissionaire structure still valid and can you still give 2% to the commissionaire? Well, obviously BAPS makes very vague, very, I think only one time reference to commissionaires that the, they will be looked upon and that, that has to do with the the fact that on the payroll of the commissioner, typically there's one or more uh, high-end decision makers, which doesn't necessarily, in a formal sense, belong to the commissioner functionality. Well, then immediately you get the discussion with the local tax inspector. If he really dr drills down, your position is, uh, well, I'm charging this high, highly ranked officer who's making all these value-adding decisions, I'm charging his cost to the, to the principal, so what's the issue? Uh, tax authorities these days will take a position, well, we're really looking at uh, an on-the-ground commissionaire plus model where 2% is certainly not going to be enough anymore, and, and we believe that it will attract uh, a significant uplift on, on the 2%, um, given the, the whole direction BAPS is taking. I think as a, as a last point I want to raise, uh, and that's, a, that's almost like a, um, the essential question for all of you to, to ask yourself, what is the right balance between favorable tax regimes and, and economic substance? And where does uh, the usage of favorable tax regimes lead to a tipping point where tax and transfer pricing uh, suddenly um, escalates to become a reputational risk issue rather than just a, a pure technical and, and transpricing risk uh, issue. I think that is closing uh, the, the, my part of the, of the presentation and I'm going to open the floor for maybe one or two last questions. Yeah, one of the questions is uh, but almost 
politically sensitive as to how the, how the U.S. is looking at VAPS. Well, if, if VAPS has the following impact, if you if you take a, an illustrative example, and I, I don't know all the details, but just to illustrate it, assume Apple has a big wide income. Uh, and 15 EU members do believe that wide income should be reported in, in their tax return and they start taxing it. Um, that four, 15 times tax on the same profit will certainly have a major impact on, on the profit line of, uh, of, of Apple. Uh, uh, being stock quoted, it will have an impact on the shares of Apple, uh, as we know, uh, a lot of the pensions in the, in the U.S. are based on on stock uh, on, on on positions in stock. So suddenly you you're eating up uh, uh, 20 20 percent of the pension rights of the population in the U.S. You, you can imagine that type of uh, uh, side effects, and which could be significant if if these extremes are are being looked at, are, are not very are not perceived very favorable in in, 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 in a U.S. based multinational. So you have the, the discussion, will the U.S. really go along with the BAPS in its current phase or will the, the U.S. also want to protect some of its, um, its corporates against these unwarranted usage of BAPS which is sort of going back to the quotes of, da of Mr. Danilak of, of the IRS who believes that uh, it's, it, it, it will be uh, uh, a stick by non-U.S. tax inspectors to hit the corporates with. Currently, it's, it's unknown. We know there's some sentiments within the IRS which are uh, less favorable on, on BAPS. Uh, again, we believe the train has left the station, but again, we, we would not be able to make up our minds what the, what the final position is going to be. I think they also mentioned that the U.S. is not only home country, but also source country, uh, where I think it's the same uh, Mr. Denelec also mentioned. In that case, of course, we will uh, similarly apply the BEPS uh, concepts. It's not, not one-way uh, street. I agree. I agree. Okay, um, I think it's uh, time to close this call. I wish uh, to, think, to thank all of you for your participation. Um, uh, again, we had 26 countries on, the, on this call, so I was very, very pleased to see this wide interest. And I hope to see you and, and, uh, as a participant to our upcoming webinars in the next couple of weeks. So thank you very much, and uh, have a nice day. And this uh, closes the call of, uh, of today.